So we invented a way to get there, and it worked. It worked nearly every time. So uh, that always fascinated me, and it was, uh, you know, we've lost something in America since then. I watched a documentary about this the other day, and they said when Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon, the number of people who went and got a degree in science and engineering rose dramatically. Everybody, NASA was hiring, of course, engineers everywhere, and there was this interest in technology. And, you know, it's sort of, well, no, what does, if I were to ask you a question, what does NASA do right now, could you answer the question? Right. In other words, we kind of had to push it in gear because after the space shuttle, what was, there, what was there to do? So, you know, that always fascinates me, but here's my point. One of these days, we are going to fly through space, you and I, together, and not on a rocket. We're literally going to go from here to heaven, and the universe will basically be right there for us. And to me, that's a great thought. I like that. So, you know, hang on to your... I wouldn't buy a ticket just yet to go to the moon, because that's probably coming one of these days. They're probably... You, I mean, I would expect 30, 40 years from now, they'll be selling tickets to the moon. But I wouldn't buy mine. So I'm going to wait until I have a new body that can handle the trip. Amen? And then I'll be good. Genesis chapter 1. Uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 14 again. That We're going to look at the sun, moon, and the stars. Last Sunday night we examined the sun a little bit. And I don't know if I taught everything on that. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll pick it up with the stars. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Four things that he says there. Because light, the light that he's talking about is related to the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because Jesus then is the light of the world. The light of the gospel shines out from the Bible. And so that's why you see the patterns there that you see the order that God sets forth in his Bible. He, said, he establishes it from the beginning to the end. So he then says in verse 15, And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So we have the sun, we have the moon. The sun rules the day, the moon rules the evening. And along with the moon, the lesser light, we have the stars of heaven as well. So they are sort of ruling over the darkness. And there's much typology in that. We're going to get into that tonight. And uh, so then he says, in verse 16, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. So he's established here in verse 16, the sun, the moon, then the stars. In verse 17, God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And think about the, think about the symbolism of both of those terms, the light and the darkness. When you were lost, you were in the darkness. And there were certain things that ruled over you. Certain, I'll just, you know, stars are angels in the Bible. That's, what, that's one of the things we're going to look at. So when you were in darkness, you had certain principalities, rulers of the darkness of this world. They ruled over you. They ruled your, you don't have to be in astrology and they ruled over your life. But when you came, when the day star rose which is the sun, which is Jesus Christ. When that day star rose in your heart, God shined the light in you. The light was the gospel. The light was salvation. You immediately responded to that. You said, I want to be a child of the light. I don't want to be in darkness anymore. And that's how God transformed you. He transforms. He shows us that every night and every day. That's why in Lamentations, he said that his mercy is renewed every single day. God has a brand new set of mercies for you every day. Aren't you glad for that one? Amen. So anyway, uh, in the evening, at verse 19, the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Father, I pray, Lord, you bless my voice. Give me grace tonight as I teach. 
the things, Father, that you have fascinated my mind with all my life. I pray, dear God, that I would bring glory to your name as we study the creation, the beauty of the day, the beauty of the night. Father, we thank you for all of it. And Lord, I just pray, God, that your grace would be on us tonight as we learn your word. Teach us some great and mighty things that we don't know. Remind us of some things that we do. But fill our minds and our hearts with knowledge that surpasses what all the scientists think, what all the atheists think, what all the evolutionists think. Father, fill our minds with Bible knowledge that we know. It's not a theory. We know that you created the heaven and the earth. You created everything that is. And we love you for that. You're a good God. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now let's look at some of these stars. I've got uh, Amos, let me make sure I'm getting, yeah. Amos, uh, Amos chapter 5, turn there. I like this. Let me kind of fill you in on some of the things I've been studying. As you turn to Amos 5, there are a significant number of people who are coming forward, who are saying that there has been, you know what, I know what that is. Hang on. I know exactly what that is. I had this set up. I was thinking about singing a song this morning. And uh, then I remember Steve and Jenny, so I backed out. That's what it was. This has got all my music on it. I send it through that and it comes out. Anyway, that's what was making the noise. But anyway, there are significant a number of people now who are and have been in the military, Pentagon, CIA, NSA. High-ranking government officials who are coming forward and saying, we know that we are being visited by craft from things from so from somewhere not from earth we know that the pentagon uh came out a couple years ago released a statement to the new york times saying they just spent 22 million dollars over five years to study and investigate ufos now i'm not going to talk about ufos tonight but i'm making a point there there's a lot of group and of course the pentagon just recently said they they said this in the last week they admitted we are, we are actively involved in every military sighting of an unidentified craft. We, we are doing this. And we are admitting that they are real. This is not fiction. This is not science fiction. This is not anything make-believe. This is not some guy drunk that thought he saw something in the air and it wasn't anything. This is the military and we have the best pilots in the world who are chasing UFOs, and they don't know what they are. So you have a lot of people in this country and around the world. The, uh, an ex-Minister of Defense, top-ranking defense official from Great Britain, who goes around telling everybody, Great Britain knows that they're UFOs. We know it. You have Canada involved in that. United States now involved in that. You have countries all over the world now that are, that are releasing their files, saying we've been chasing these things for years. All right, here's my point. You have a lot of people now who are reaching up to the stars. They're saying, whatever these things are, we believe that they're beneficial to mankind. We believe that they have something for us. And we want to reach out to whatever entities that is out there. We want to reach out to them and join with them, link together with them, because they have technology that will help humans to go to the next step of evolution. Okay? What they're, do they're not doing anything different than what is in your Bible. Because in the Old Testament, God warned Israel. And I'll show you the scripture. God warned Israel about looking to the moon, the sun, and the stars, and then worshiping them. And in worshiping them, they're sending their prayers to the stars and saying, you rule over us. And they have names for some of these. I'm going to list those in a minute. But notice what your Bible says in Amos 5. Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion. Don't seek the stars. Seek the creator of those stars. Amen? But what's happening is you have 
a growing group of people who are being led to believe that whatever, whatever race, whatever creatures exist up in the heavens, they believe that they mean no harm to this earth and that they are superior to us and we want the technology that they have so that we can become gods. I can show you the statements that, have, that they've made. They want that technology. They want man. This was evidence in the Tower of Babel. Man wants to make his presence among the stars. It's what man wants. And God says, you're reaching too low. Don't call to the stars. Call to me. I made the stars. I'm superior to them. However high the stars are, I'm the most high God. So seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. What are the seven stars? Anybody know? Huh? Could be. Could be. Now I mentioned last Sunday night, I was going to show you something. I hope I get to it tonight. Because I've filled in a lot of stuff. Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. Who, what is Orion? Does anybody know? I used to think that was Orion. Okay, I'll show you in a minute. Watch this. And turneth the shadow of death into morning. That's what I was saying a while ago. You were in darkness. You were in the shadow of death. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Now God has brought the light to your life. And turneth the shadow of death into morning and maketh the day dark with night. That calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Now in this one verse, here's what I have up on the screen. This describes, number one, notable stars in the sky. The seven stars, you can, you, you said they were the Pleiades. I'm not arguing with that. You can look up and if you know what to look for, you can see the Pleiades. There's seven stars there. Okay. They're very bright too. As well as the, this also describes the motion of the sun to create daylight from darkness and vice versa. That's what this verse is saying. And it also describes, in my opinion, the moon's gravity, which creates the swelling of the tides. When the tides come in and go out, it is caused by, by lunar gravity. Notice that verse. He calleth the water for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. So it's actually there's two things there. Number one, the bringing in of the tides caused by the moon's gravity. Moon cause, pulls the water in or pulls the water out. I'm not sure which one it is. But we know that the, the tides are caused by the moon. But then also, and this was something that Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 1, where he said, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. So what he was saying, he was describing the water cycle. The water runs in the rivers, runs down to the Gulf of Mexico, and here in this area, that Gulf moisture comes up, pours out over Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, goes up to Illinois, Indiana, but it's water from the sea, comes down as rain, which goes back into the rivers, which goes back into the ocean. And that's what that verse is saying. He called it for the waters of the sea and poured them out upon the face of the earth. Nobody knew this 3,000 years ago, which was about when this was written. Nobody knew that. But God did because God is the one who created it. God is the one who made it. They didn't know that the moon is what pulled the tides in. But God knew that and God is the one who created it. So... Instead of looking, people worship nature, they worship trees, they worship stars, they worship the sun, they worship all kinds of things. Instead of worshiping that, why don't we worship the one who made all that? He seems to be smarter than everything else is. Amen? John, or Job chapter 9, he, which maketh, he's talking about God, which maketh Arcturus. What is that? There he is mentioning Orion again, and the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. So then he mentions also Job 38. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? What does that mean? The bands of Orion. Psalm, now look at Psalm 147. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Now, I've talked about this before, but here's what really blows my mind. The fact that Paul said that we are in the company of an innumerable company of angels. Meaning that the angels themselves cannot be numbered. Apparently, there is an infinite group of angels. Now how, how can you number something 
that the Bible says is innumerable. When you number something, you're setting a limit. You're saying this, there is five things here. And so they're one, two, three, four, five. And that's it. There's not, if there's five, there's not six. And if there's five, there's not four. When you number something, it gives it sort of a, a limit. So how can God number something that cannot be numbered? I want you to think about that. I'm not criticizing the Bible. What I'm telling you is God's smart. Yes. That could be. So how do you grasp infinity? Because that's what he's saying, innumerable company of angels. How do you grasp infinity? Then we know, and I'll have the verses here in a little bit. We know that Satan is going to take his tail, Revelation 12, and grab one third of the angels, cast them to the earth. Again, what is one third of infinity? How does God figure, what calculator does God use to figure that one out? Okay, what I'm saying is, God is smart. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God apparently has the ability not only to number the angels, but to give a name for every single one of them. Now, so I got a little contest here. A couple weeks ago, I asked you to name for me the three named angels. So now what I'm going to tonight is ask you to give me the name of every star slash angel in the Bible that you can think of. God named stars. He gives the name for every star. And some of their names are mentioned in Scripture. Now remember, stars are angels. So... Include in that list the names of angels that you know about, but also give me the names of the stars that God has named in the Bible. Now, you can cheat and look on the screen. Arcturus, Orion, Pleiades. That's three of them. Give me some more. You have Arcturus, Orion, Pleiades. Huh? I need names. They have names. Well, I'm using that in a general way. That's the name that God gives to that star or group. Arcturus is one star, but Orion is a group of stars. But that's the name he's given. So I'm looking for a name. So who said? Gabriel. Gabriel. Michael. Michael. Lucifer. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. No? Well, not bad. That's not on my list, but I'll take that. What else? There's some others. Stars that are named in the Bible. Anybody else? Huh? Jesus. That's a good one. That's it. That's on my list. What else? Eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. Orion, Pleiades, Arcturus, Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, Jesus, the star of Jacob, Moloch, Chion or Remphan, and Wormwood. That's Revelation 8. A star fell down from heaven and the star's name was Wormwood. So that's ten, but who... You said, what else? Melchizedek? So that should be, that should be an 11th one there. All right? And possibly there's one other I miss. I'm, so I'm thinking 12, because 12 is associated with the stars, and I'll show you that in a little bit. So Orion, the Pleiades, Arcturus, Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, Jesus, who is the star of Jacob, Moloch, Chion, and Remphan are the same names. That's Saturn, by the way, and a star called Wormwood. Here's the seven stars. You go out uh, at night, and you can see a sort of a bright cluster of stars with a haze in it. Uh, you can see it with the eye, but if you have a pair of binoculars, it's better. If you have a telescope, that's better to see it with. But that's the seven stars. Um, here's a, a, a disc made out of clay that dates back to 1600 B.C. that shows the sun the crescent moon and the, what I have circled there is the seven stars of the Pleiades. 
So they knew him, they knew him back then, okay? And they had him named, and, and of course God mentions him in the Bible. Here's Orion. Orion is very easy to see, but Orion only shows up in the wintertime. Uh, notice the three stars in the middle. The idea is that Orion, the two bright stars up here are his shoulders, the two stars down below are his knees, and the three stars in the middle is his belt. And God talked about who can, what was that verse where it talked about, um, canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? In other words, who is it that can take off Orion's belt? God. The answer to that is God. Who can bind the influence of the seven stars? Who can, now watch this. We know that in the end days, at some point, all the stars of heaven are going to be shut off. They're going to be darkened. So to bind their influence, be to turn them off. Who can do that? God can. Who can take the belt? Who can loose the belt off of Orion? Who can take... And see, you're talking about three individual stars, and they're not right next to each other. You're talking, they are millions and millions of miles away from each other. Probably one of them farther off from us than the other, but to us, they all look like they're in the same place. Who can do that? God can do it. God has a command of all the stars of heaven. Here's Arcturus. If you find the Big Dipper, the very end of the dipper handle, you draw a straight line and you're going to find Arcturus. Now, who can tell me why it's called Arcturus? What does that word mean, that name mean? Does anybody know? What does it sound like? Arctic. There's a reason why. The word Arctic means the bear. And Arcturus is related to this one star Arcturus is part of the constellation of Arcturus, the bear, and it's in the northern sky in the Arctic. Okay, so they're all related. Now, think about this. We know in Ezekiel 1, where God, when God came to present himself to Ezekiel, riding his cherubim chariot, that he came from the north. So God always warned in the prophets, he warned Israel about an army that was coming down from the north. The, or he said the north country. So I don't think he meant Russia and I don't think he meant the Canadians. And I'm not worried about Greenland and Iceland invading anytime soon. There is no land at the North Pole. There's nothing there but ice and seawater. So what did he mean by that? I think that it's an invasion of devils. Coming out from the same place that God came from. That's my, that's my theory. Notice, I, I found this. This is the best picture of a star other than the sun. You know, these things are far away. So they aimed a telescope at this particular star. I forgot which one this was. But notice its color. And when I saw that, I'm reminded of Ezekiel 1, verse 7, verse 13, verse 27... Notice that when Ezekiel saw the chariot, the angels that were coming to him, they were the color of burnished brass. Their appearance was like burning coals. I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about. Now what we know about, the, about angels, the Bible says that they're made of fire. That's their substance, what they're made of. And if you think about stars being angels, it makes sense. Because what are stars? They're fire. They're big, huge balls of flames up in the, up in the heavens. And the heavens are filled with them. So the two ideas match that angels are made of fire and so are all these stars. And it matches the same color. That's why I put that out. Now, here's something I think that matters when you start thinking about what those stars are. They are angels. They are angels. All those dots that you see in the sky. And you have to ask the question, because I'll show you the verse. How does the dragon then take a third, one third of all the stars of heaven and drag them down to the earth? 
What, what are the physics of that? How is that even possible when all these stars are billions and billions and billions of miles away from each other? How's that going to happen? I think the, I, I mean, I trust the word of God. I like science. I like learning things about the stars and the moon and the, the universe and the earth and how God made everything. I mean, I, there's a lot of that that I believe, but I believe the Bible, period. So I believe that every one of those dots in the sky is what we can see of the realm of the angels. I don't, and there's probably more to them that we cannot see. But I think that's what we can see. Notice, and here's my case. I'm laying out my case for you. Job 38, 7. God said to Job, where were you when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So he calls the stars the sons of God, which is a name referred to, if you turn to, uh, turn your Bible to Job 1. Job chapter 1. Come on, let me hear them Bibles rattling. Rattle, rattle, rattle. Job chapter 1. And you look at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Sons of God. Who were, what were they? Again in chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So you have twice now the sons of God being presented before the Lord. And then you have Job 38, 7 that's telling you the sons of God are the stars. So here's my thing. Can we believe the Bible to be a little... It is warm in here, is it not? Can you turn that... Okay. Maybe turn it down on one side. And if everybody's hot, go over here. If you're cold, come over here. So that's the only thing I know how to do. Everybody's different. And you got some people shivering all the time. Some people burning up. I never know what to do. I'm burning up. But that's just me. So I'm triple layered here. So anyway. By the way, thanks to Steve and Jenny. For, you don't know if you noticed. That's my dinosaur tie. It's got cute dinosaurs on it. And so far they have not eaten me up. So I'm very thankful for that. Now, but again, I believe the word of God. I believe that every one of those dots of light up in the sky are the sons of God, the heavenly host, the angelic realm. By the way, when it said, now how did Job know? Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Job lived about the time of Abraham. How did Job know that the stars sang because science didn't know that until recently. There's an actual science called asteroseismology. It's a big word. But what they know is it's the study of stars and their vibrations. And all of the stars have seismic activity, which means like the earth shaking. All the stars vibrate. They know this. They've been able to measure it. And when something, you know, when something like a guitar string, Steve, what happens when you pull the guitar string? It vibrates and that vibration causes the molecules of air that's smacking around and it makes that sound. So when these stars, in their vibrations, they're singing. They're making a noise in the heavens. Your bi the oldest book of the Bible knew what science just figured out in the last few years. Bible's right. This is not, just, this is not a book of fairy tales, a book of myths written by... Desert nomads who didn't know anything. When you examine the scriptures and when you look and see what science is discovering, you find out that the Bible knew that all along. So the stars really do sing. Psalm 148.3, praise ye him, sun and moon, praise ye him, all the stars of light. Now what he's telling you is that these stars had the ability somehow to give praise to God. Well, we know that's what John saw when John was lifted up in, into heaven in Revelation chapter 4. 
he, he was able to hear the actual praise going on by the angelic beings. They were singing, holy, holy, holy. And they were singing a song up in heaven. They were singing the song of Moses or something like that. But anyway, they were singing up there. And John was able to see that. So it's ascribed to them the ability to give praise to God. Isaiah 14, 13. We know that one of the things Lucifer wants to do is, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So what do we know then? What do we, what do we see in scripture that he's really wanting to do? He's wanting to rule over all of the angelic realm. He wants to be in control of them. That's an army. And that is a big army. Because it's innumerable. And Satan, the created being, not the creator, Satan wants to rule over the stars of God, meaning he wants to rule and control all of the angelic realm. So when you go to Revelation 12, that's the war that you see. That's the battle that's being fought. He's fighting Michael, the archangel, for control of heaven. To rule over the stars of the sky. Judges 5.20. Look at this. Uh, this is, um, oh, who is this singing? Deborah, the one female judge of Israel. Deborah is singing this song after the victory that Israel won. And she says they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, apparently, what the Bible's telling us is, I think this was, um, let's see, Judges chapter 4. I think this was Barak, not Obama. Or Barak. Yeah, it's Barak. Barak was the captain of the army, of the Israelite army. And apparently, the Bible's telling you that Barak and his army were helped by angels to fight that war and to win that war because they won the war and they weren't supposed to they were in bondage so apparently Barak and his soldiers were helped by the angels in heaven the stars in their courses fought against Sisera uh, I showed you that Revelation 9 look at this look at what the Bible says the fifth angel sounded I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, if you look then at Revelation 9, turn there. Make that sound. Look in Revelation 9. You're going to see that this star actually used that key to open up the gate of hell. It's in verse 2. The fifth angel sounded. I saw a star fall from heaven. To him was given to him. Meaning that the Bible is describing to a star, a person, personhood, a living entity. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Verse 2, and he opened the bottomless pit. So if it's just a ball of gas and fire and light in the heavens, it doesn't add up. But if you believe the scriptures that what we're seeing in all of those stars is... Only a part of their whole being. They are angels. And apparently some of them are really big. That a particular star was cast down from heaven. But before he was thrown down from heaven, he was given. Because who holds the keys before this star has it? Who had it? Jesus did. He said, I'm the one that has the keys. Okay. I'm the one who opens and no man closes. The one who closes, no man opens. So that door is not coming open except Jesus wanted it open. So he gives the key to this star. Now, my personal view of who this is, I think this is Lucifer. Because it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And here I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him. My thinking is that it's Satan being cast out. Could be wrong. Now look at Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Just a page or two. Verse four. Well, let's look at verse three. 
There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So think about that. I mean, if these stars and all they are is just humongous, flaming, glowing balls of fire. If that's all they are, how is that even possible that Satan can take a third of them and cast them to the earth? But if you believe then that they are a representation of actual angels of the angelic realm, and we know there's various kinds, then it kind of starts making sense. These are real angels. and Because if you look then in verse 7, same chapter, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. So there are angels that are aligned with Satan. There are angels that are aligned with God and Michael. Michael is their prince. So a third then of an innumerable amount of angels, a third of that is severed off and they are fighting with Lucifer against Michael. What's the goal? The goal is what Lucifer said in Isaiah 14. I will, I will be like the Most High. His goal is to sit on the throne in heaven. And rule. It's always been his goal. That's what he wanted. Ezekiel 28. Lucifer says, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. So that's what his plan is from the very moment that pride was found in his heart. And he was put out from his original position in heaven. So he wants to sit on God's throne. So he knows he's got to fight the battle to get there. Michael is not going to let Lucifer just walk up and sit on God's throne. God's not going to let him either. Amen. We're on the right team. Even if the blues lose, we're on the right team. Amen. Amen. So the dragon fought in his angels. Verse 8. And prevailed not. Amen. Because two thirds is more than one third. Michael has two-thirds of the angels. The devil only has one-third. The Drake uh, prevailed not, neither was, there found any place, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So I see verse 9 connected to verse 4, where the dragon takes a third of the stars and casts them to the earth. And then later on, we see that it's describing angels. When those angels and Satan lose the battle, that God expels them from heaven. They no longer have a right to have access to heaven. God expels them and casts them not on some planet somewhere, not on some moon somewhere. Out of all of the universe, God picks earth. So I believe the earth is the center of everything God is doing. Amen? So that's called geocentricity. I believe that the earth is the focus of everything that God does. Everything. We are. Daniel 8 gives us another uh, view of this. Daniel 8, 10. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. So now Daniel's connecting the two words. The host is an army. And in this case, it's an army of angels in heaven. And then he calls them, he cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground. So I see it as describing the host is the stars and the stars are the host. The stars are angels. And a third of them cast down to the earth. Look at this. Now, take that idea and think of what God tells us concerning, number one, Israel, the Old Testament, and the church, the New Testament. Genesis twenty-two seventeen. 17. Then in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. And as the sand of the sea which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So God promises that Israel will be as the stars of heaven. 
Genesis 37, and there's multiple verses in the Old Testament. I mean, tons of verses in the Old Testament where God reiterates the same idea that Israel is going to be like the stars. They're going to be the stars for heaven. So in Genesis 37, he dreamed yet another dream. This is Jacob or Joseph. This is what got his brothers mad at him. Joseph dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And his father figured it out. Made him mad. He said, so what are you saying? You saying that me and your mother and your brothers are going to bow down to you? The son being uh, Jacob, his mother being, um, I can't remember who the, uh, the mother, Rachel was the mother of Joseph. And his 11 brothers, the, the tribes of Israel. So here again, it's saying that the stars and the tribes of Israel, Israel is going to be as the stars of heaven. Deuteronomy 1.10, the Lord God hath multiplied you, and behold, you are this day as the stars of heaven for multiplicity. So there he says it again. And there's, like I said, there's multiple verses in the Old Testament that ascribes a promise to Israel that they will be like the stars. Deuteronomy 4.19. Now here's a warning from God. Watch this. In fact, turn to Deuteronomy 4. I want you to see this. Look at it in your Bible. Turn your Bible. Come on. I'm going to start... Making these verses in such small print, I won't be able to read them. I want you to open your Bible. I want you to see it in there. I want you to underline it. Make notes. Bless her heart. Sister Waymire. you know what she used to do? I was amazed. First time I found this out. I preached a message one time. And I had said, I've preached this message here before, but I don't remember when I did. And Miss Waymire had it written down in her Bible that I had preached a message on that verse and she put the date down. She told me, she said, it was this date right here. I went, she wrote down every sermon she heard. She wrote down the date next to the verse that it was based on. She now gone into heaven. She don't need to write them anymore. Amen. But that blessed me. Deuteronomy 419. Lest thou lift up God's warning, Israel. Lest thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven. So now he says it again. The stars are the host of heaven. The host is the army, the angelic order. Shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided into all nations under the whole heaven. What religion is it where the stars tell you what you're going to do that day? astrology so here again people who by the way who does who does not know their sign their astrological sign who does not know theirs you don't know yours okay sterling doesn't that doesn't surprise me okay i'm i'm, I'm not knocking it because it doesn't i'm a gemini and I'm, i've told this several times but when i was a boy I used to love to get, we had the daily paper, the Daily News Democrat was delivered every day. And the first thing I would do is I open it up and I go to the astrology deal. And I'd, I'm a Gemini, so I'd look at Gemini. And I would read that and I would go, oh my goodness, that is exactly what happened to me today. I didn't realize that it was for the next day. So what does that tell you? You can make it up. You look, you read that stuff and go, oh my goodness, that's what happened. You can, it's not real. Stars don't know what you're going to do. God does. Stars don't have that power. God does. But here's what astrology is. Astrology says that the way the stars are all lined up on a, any particular day, and you take your birthday, and you were born on a, particular day because the stars wanted you born on this particular day and then it says there are people you can hang with and people you can't hang with there are people you can marry and people you can't marry there are business things that you can have with certain people from other signs or whatever and certain people you can't have anything to do with and because the stars are on this day and you were born on this day and the stars are all doing this up in the sky that means that you're going to have this kind of day and the stars don't have any say in it whatsoever God told, God said it was bondage. Don't do that. Why don't you worship me? I created them. They do what I tell them to do. 
Follow the one who created those stars, not the stars. But God told them not to worship them as if they were real gods, and they are. I mean, how many, how many nations in the world worship the sun? All of them. Practically every nation in the world throughout history has worshipped the sun, calling it different names and ascribing it different powers or whatever, but they've all done it. Incidentally, they've also worshipped the moon, and the moon is almost always seen as a female, while the sun is seen as a male. Which is interesting, because always in the Bible, when God speaks of the moon, calls it a her. The moon shall not give her light, but the sun shall give his light. But God told him not to do that. And in Acts chapter 7, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your God, Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. God said, for worshiping the stars, I want to put you in captivity and bondage. Jude one thirteen, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars. And he's talking about, Jude's talking about the false teachers. False teachers. Where are they getting their inspiration from? They're getting their inspiration from doctrines of devils, and those devils are stars. And in this case, they're wandering stars. You can't count on them. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So the stars rule over the darkness. And when you choose to worship the stars, you are going to be in bondage to darkness for the rest of your life. Amen? I'm almost done. I'll cut it off here. Philippians 2.15. Now watch this. Here's, here's us now. That you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God. We, you and I, born again, are now the sons of the Most High God. My first birth was Milton Don and Judy A. Hoggard. That was my first birth. My second birth. The most high God. He literally is my father. And I am a son of, not the son of God, a son of God. So that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Think of the snake. Crooked. Among whom ye shine as light in the world. So, think about it. Here's Israel. Here's the camp of Israel. The tabernacle was where God was. And how many tribes were there? How many tribes were there? You're ready to leave now. I hadn't let you go yet. Still asking. There were 12 tribes. How many months are there? Twelve. Because the months are based upon the moon and the stars. So here's God, or the sun, Jesus, surrounded by the twelve constellations. The twelve tribes. And the New Testament version of that is Jesus, the sun, and how many disciples? Twelve who shine as lights in a dark world. Israel was promised that they would be as the stars of heaven. We also, as sons of God, were promised that we would shine as lights in the world. And we would, Jesus said, when we're resurrected, we're going to be like the angels which are in heaven. So that's why there were 12 tribes, Old Testament, 12 disciples, New Testament. God is showing Jesus is the sun, the light, surrounded by those 12 tribes, surrounded by the 12 disciples. It's the same. It's the promise of God manifested by the light of the scriptures. Somebody say amen. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. It's a mouthful of knowledge. And I didn't, I didn't invent it. You did. Father, I, I love you. I love, I love the creation. I love the beauty of what you've done. I love the science of what you've done. The fact that the stars do actually sing. I love that. And I thank you, Lord, for 
giving us divine knowledge, giving us revelation, giving us understanding. And we are lights in a very, very dark world. People, they don't believe you. They don't trust you. And Father, I thank you, God, that you've blessed us with that light. Give us knowledge, give us understanding, and prepare us, Father, with that knowledge for days that lie ahead. And as dark as they are, we pray that you'd give us light. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.